Hello and welcome to the channel. Today I want to talk about the Junkers JU87 Stuka and more specifically the Gustav or G variant, outfitted with 37mm flak guns slung under the wings, which was evaluated at the Luftwaffe's Reschland Testing Center for suitability as an aerial artillery tank busting platform. The JU87 G1 prototypes were then sent to the experimental Panzer Jagdkommando Weiss where they were successfully flown by veteran test pilots, including the Stuka's most famous ace, Hans Ulrich Rudel. However, upon researching information for this video, I quickly discovered that very little verifiable primary source combat information exists for the Kanonenvogel, or Cannonbird Tank Hunter variant of the Stuka. Initially, I had planned to make a video recreating a claim made by the Armchair Historian channel that a squadron of Kanonenvogel Stukas attacked and wiped out the 2nd Guards tank battalion during the Battle of Kursk, and that it marked the first time in history that a tank formation was defeated by air power alone, thinking that this would make for an interesting video. So I set about looking for details of this account, but could find none. I then went ahead and checked all the sources linked in their video, and still find nothing to substantiate this claim. Puzzled, I kept digging deeper, determined to get to the bottom of the matter, and I discovered that the claim was actually confused with an account by Bruno Meyer flying Henschel HS129s, which I now quote from Paul Carell's book, Scorched Earth, page 69 to 71. Bruno Meyer commanded the 4th Tank Buster Group of the 9th Ground Support Geschwader, based near Mikoyanovka. On its field stood 68 brand new Henschel HS129 armoured ground support aircraft. Each of these machines was fitted, in addition to its machine gun, with a 3cm cannon. They were the flying anti-tank guns of Operation Citadel. Here now was an opportunity to test a new weapon. By radio, Maya alerted the ground control of his grouper and ordered takeoff by separate staffers. As the first Staffel came zooming up, Maya instructed the pilots by radio, then began a historic battle. For the first time in military history, a large armoured formation was opposed from the air alone. The aircraft attacked from low level. Like hawks, they pounced on the Russian tanks from behind and from the side. The cannon flashed and barked. Once. Twice, three times, direct hit, explosion, fire, and flames, the stricken T-34s were careering over the battlefield. In between the low-level attacks by the Henschel tank busting aircraft, Major Grushel's Fokovulf ground support group attacked the Russian infantry columns and the hastily positioned flak guns with high fragmentation bombs. It was a battle of machines. The Russian tanks were unable to cope with this unaccustomed attack. They drove across each other's paths, got mixed up with one another, and fell an easy prey to Meyer's flying tank busters. After an hour, the Soviet brigade was smashed. 50 tanks littered the battlefield, burnt out or heavily damaged. The deadly threat to House's deep flank was averted even before SS Panzer Corps and 4th Panzer Army had become aware of it. However, it turns out there are several problems with this account when trying to verify the claims made by both the Germans and the Soviets. Firstly, the reported strength of 68 brand new HS-129s appears to be contradicted by the fact the squadrons involved in the attack had been in action since 1942, making it very unlikely that they were brand new. And secondly, the HS-129B2 wasn't a new weapon that required testing as it had become operational in 1942. Additionally, when trying to verify the deployment strength of the squadrons in question, it does not add up to 68. As far as the Soviet account is concerned on the day in question, only 11 tanks were reported to have been lost by the 2nd Guards Tank Corps, and importantly, the SS Tortenkopf Panzer Regiment, who were engaged with the 2nd Guards Tank Corps on the day in question, supports the Soviet version of events with their own combat report. The fact that Tortenkopf was engaged in combat with the 2nd Guards Tank Corps 
also contradicts the claim of a tank formation being stopped entirely by air power. As for the JU-87G, it is claimed and widely repeated by YouTube historians, as well as in general across the internet, that Hans Ulrich Rudel, who was one of the pilots selected to fly the G1 variant, and Panzerjagdkommando Weiss, managed to claim 12 victories against Soviet tanks single-handedly when first testing the aircraft, and that this is what led to the limited conversion to Kanunenvogels and formation of Panzerjagdstaffen for use in the Kursk counter-offensive. However, as with Bruno Meyer's account, Rudel's account should be viewed with skepticism, as it has nothing to back it up other than his word, as all the secondary sources that mention it are quoting it from his own book and taking the account as being true verbatim with no other sources to verify the claims. Those who mention the account as secondary sources claim that Rudel destroyed these tanks on the 7th of July 1943 but there is no verifiable evidence of any JU-87G1s in operation until August of 1943, which casts a shadow of doubt over the otherwise unverifiable claim made by Rudel. What is true is that the Kanonenvogel did see some success on the Eastern Front, particularly during the ill-fated Kursk operation, and it did pave the way for the aerial artillery concept in which the use of dedicated air power against armor was a viable strategy. So much so that Hans Ulrich Rudel, the Stuka's greatest ace, was hired by the United States Air Force in an advisory role for the development of their A-10 Thunderbolt, or Warthog, dedicated ground attack aircraft. The bitter reality is, is that the Luftwaffe were incapable of maintaining the sortie rate required in order for them to achieve anywhere near the success these two most famous and often repeated stories imply. In summary, what began as an idea for an exciting video of what I thought was a true account of an historically unprecedented tank versus air power scenario turned out to be a case of misquoted sources based on unverified claims that nonetheless make for a compelling story. As the saying goes, never let the truth get in the way of a good story. In the interest of academic integrity, I have sourced the references for my claims below, where you can get a detailed description of all the discrepancies, which will hopefully serve as a reminder to all that not everything you hear about on YouTube is true, and not necessarily because of any vice or bad intention on the part of the content creators, who are only repeating what they believe are soundly researched historians on the matter, but rather because history is an ever-evolving process that can change based on the uncovering of previously unknown information that contradicts long-held beliefs. If you enjoyed this content, don't forget to like, share and subscribe for more.